Welcome everyone to this week's Emmet webinar featuring Iran expert, the brilliant and insightful Benam Bentaloglu. I'm thrilled that Benam was able to join us to discuss Saturday night's unprecedented attack by the Islamic Republic on Israel. We are very fortunate to have relationships with the world's esteemed ex experts on national security matters, whose insights we are able to make available to our supporters on our weekly webinars, and we appreciate everyone's support of Emmett's important work. I urge you all at this very critical time in Israel's existence to please consider sponsoring a webinar or simply making a donation, as now more than ever, our work with policymakers and ensuring pro-Israel and pro-America policies are promoted and passed on the Hill, it, it's just, it's urgent. Today's webinar will be recorded and available for viewing, and I urge you all to share this with others. If you have any questions for Benam, you can place them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I'll try to get to as many as possible later in the program. Please only submit questions. Uh, Benam Ben Talablu is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where he focuses on Iranian security and political issues. He previously served as a research fellow and senior Iran analyst at FDD. Um, leveraging his subject matter expertise and native Farsi skills, Benam has closely tracked a wide range of Iran-related topics, including nuclear nonproliferation, ballistic missiles, sanctions, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the foreign and security policy of the Islamic Republic, and internal Iranian politics. Frequently called upon to brief journalists, congressional staff, and other Washington audiences, Benam has also testified before the U.S. Congress and Canadian Parliament. His analyses have been quoted in and he has contributed to or co-authored articles for a multitude of publications and has appeared on a variety of broadcast programs. Welcome, Benam, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I know how busy you are and we greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Lori. Thank you so much. And to Emmett for all you do, Sarah, the whole team, uh, really, thank you. Thanks. We love working with you, Benam. Um, Saturday evening's attack was unprecedented and the first time that the Islamic Republic attacked Israel directly. Why do you think it chose to do so rather than through its proxies, as has been the case in the past? And why such a brazen attack with over 350 missiles and drones? What do you think they were hoping to accomplish? Because they must have known that if Israelis died, the reprisal would make Gaza look like a target practice. So do you think Iran was just sending a message to the world that this is a new day, announcing that it's at war with Israel and that it will no longer hide behind its proxies? Or do you believe that it will revert back to claiming victory and then hiding behind surrogates? Well, there's a, a couple of important trend lines to unpack here. And those trend lines explain how we get to such a brazen, unprecedented, game-changing act like we all saw on Saturday. Uh, I know you, Lori, were glued to the screen just like I was over the weekend. Uh, it was literally uh, like something from a movie like someone who talks tough in a bar fight for years and you expect them to back down, but then they actually go through with it uh, in the end. It was a sudden plot twist. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, Iranians had promised hard revenge or a strong revenge uh, for a whole host of things that they pointed a finger at the Israelis at, uh, whether that was assassinations of nuclear scientists in Iran, some kind of covert activity, cyber attacks in Iran, you name it, but it had never gotten to this level. In fact, the entire 45-year enmity between the Islamic Republic of Iran and Israel, begot by the clerical regime in Iran, has never boiled over into something like we saw this weekend. So I just want to stress again for the audience, the history-making element uh, that we all watched on television uh, on Saturday and into Sunday. Next, of course, for the Jewish state, this is also history-making because the last time there was a state to state threat, formal and overt, because the Islamic Republic has done everything covert and via proxy for so long. And the majority of the wars of Israel have been against non-state actors, terrorist groups, particularly with boom and bust cycles of Iran-sponsored violence coming out of Gaza or terrorism in the West Bank or from the North in Lebanon, was Saddam Hussein's Iraq in 1991. And that picture stands in sharp contrast uh, even though it was the same ballistic missile strikes and again, missile defense in Israel uh, to what uh, we see now coming out of the Islamic Republic. This strike was also unprecedented. And in some weird way, if you get to grab the collar of an Iranian security planner, uh, you would ask them this question, which is for someone who doesn't, and I, I use this analogy, uh, it's a food analogy and a skiing analogy. Uh, for someone who doesn't like even black pepper on their risotto, this was akin to Iran downing a bottle of Tabasco sauce 
or for someone who doesn't even know how to balance, this was akin to just putting on skis and going on double black diamond. So every single ballistic missile operation, and there have been about a dozen ballistic missile operations, Iran has been slowly moving from the shadows out into the public space, right? We know the terror threat that the regime poses is being layered on with a more robust conventional military capability. You see this with the material support they've given the Houthis in Yemen. You see this with the material support they've given the Russians for the Putin's war in Ukraine. This is a changing face. Iranian drones today are found on four different continents. Iran actually goes to arms expos and competes with the likes of Russia, with the likes of America, with the likes of the UK, with the likes of other countries that have a more robust defense industrial base. This is an evolution in terms of their long range strike capabilities. But out of all of the use of those capabilities, meaning from 2017 to present, minus this recent attack, Iran from its own territory had never struck a defended target. So of all the ballistic missile operations in Iran's history, uh, recent history, it had never struck something that had defenses in general, even when the US, uh, when the Iranians attacked the US base in January, 2020 in Iraq, after the killing of Qasem Soleimani, that base was undefended. Americans did not have any defense. They literally had to run and take cover like it's World War I. But Israel, fortunately, and scaling up that experience from those Scud missiles Saddam fired, and all Israel had was the Pac-2, and then there were debates over is missile defense effective, and Uzi Rubin really played an instrumental role in helping lay the groundwork politically and technologically for the beginning of investments in that country's defense industrial base and partnerships with the U.S. for investing in ballistic missile defense at a time when lots of policymakers and scientists did not want to invest in this capability and did not want to invest in this tool. And there's a straight line from that to, Iran, to the layered air and missile defense architecture that uh, Israel had. So when Iran fired over 100 ballistic missiles, about 30-ish cruise missiles, about 100 more, almost like 150 some, I don't have the exact number in front of my uh, in front of me right now, 100 plus uh, suicide drones. This robust architecture is what it had to face. And not only did it have to face this, fortunately, it had the support of US and regional partners. And in the airspace between Iran and Israel, all of almost all of the suicide drones got to be intercepted. And the regime thought that they could do a layered approach, like the Russians are taking a layered approach to first drones, then missiles, to render civilian targets, military targets, open to being hit with these higher and faster flying weapons. Uh, the world showed, the civilized world showed that they will not let the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, who has a nuclear weapons program, who has the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East, to wield a tool of terror uh, against the Jewish state. And here, the Iranians claim this is a response to what happened uh, at the consulate, quote unquote, consulate uh, in Damascus. Uh, it was essentially an annex to the consulate. It, the entire building uh, reportedly was not even a diplomatic facility. They had slapped on a diplomatic plaque on the front. Everybody who died from the Iranian side were all Quds Force officers. I don't know what kind of diplomacy is conducted by Quds Force officers, but it certainly can't be the best one. And by the way, if you're there in a separate military capacity, you don't have the same kind of diplomatic immunity as a accredited diplomat through the foreign ministry serving at the formal embassy. And I don't know what kind of consulate or even consular annex has no consular staff. But all of that aside, Iran said it was in response to this. And in the week and a half leading up to the strike, I'm sorry this is going so long, but it's just important predicate. In the week and a half leading up to the strike, the regime benefited immensely from the panic in the media, the panic in the US, and even the panic in Israel. People are getting gasoline, long lines at grocery stores and uh, at gas stations, long lines at ATMs. This is the fear, exactly the instrumental fear that the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism likes to use. This is exactly the position it can exploit the most. But even to my surprise, once it did something so overt and it moved from fear into action, it actually painted a target on its own back. Uh, because now with the regime out of the shadows, 
conventionally having to talk about deterrence. And allegedly with, uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps after the strike said that any Israeli response, be it against Iran or Iranian interests, meaning regime interests, uh, would be responded to from inside Iran. So this is a game-changing moment for how the shadow wars have been played in the region, but also a game-changing moment in the history of the security policy of the Jewish state. Because for 20 years, Israel has been ringing the alarm bell about terrorism, about Iran's nuclear program, about Iran's missile program, about the drone program. But now for the first time, the option exists, even politically exists, to talk about dealing with it conventionally. Whereas the things that have been attributed to the past in Israel uh, have been either covert or unconventional. So it's a new phase of the Middle East wars. And believe it or not, it is, in my view, disconnected from Gaza, disconnected from October 7, because this response targeting game in Syria had been going on for a while. And I think the Iranians with this strike are trying to reset the entire equation of Israel's campaign between the wars, of Israel's policy of deterrence by punishment, by trying to overreact in the hopes of an Israeli attempt to even meet the overreaction would be impeded, intercepted, handcuffed even by Israel's patron, Israel's partner, Israel's ally, the United States of America. So it's an entire military operation predicated on a political understanding of we need to change the rules of the game. We're going to try to slap you and we're hoping that you get restrained. This is this is the gamble uh, that the regime took as it was coming out of the shadows. Um, thanks. We're going to spend um, uh, some time in a couple minutes talking about the U.S. and the U.S.-Israel relationship and the U.S. and Iran. But I just want to ask you if you can spend a couple of minutes talking about the changes that are occurring in the Islamic Republic's leadership and perhaps whether succession plans and new blood are leading to more brazen and reckless behavior, or at least the changes that you are, are have just shared with us. I mean, how much does our intelligence and, and that of the Israelis know about internal changes occurring in Iran's governing powers? Because I have the sense that the answer to that is very little, and it seems quite dangerous to not understand our enemies. I can only speculate because other than what intelligence agencies may have with human sources or with signals intelligence or with whatever else, uh, the vast majority of the stuff that we all actually, despite Iran being a closed society, the vast majority of the stuff uh, that people are sifting through to kind of find the signal among the noise or the needle in the haystack is largely all open source material. The fights that Iran's more cohesive and smaller but much more hardline political elite have with each other are quite public. The gradations in the Iranian parliament and the, the debates they have there, those are quite public. Uh, and when the Supreme Leader comes out and sets a direction, those are public public kind of shifts in tone, public shifts in policy. Uh, so a lot of this is detectable, monitorable, but the big trend lines for you are as follows. For the past 20 years, for a, re for a regime that came to power 45 years ago, through a broad coalition, it has consistently narrowed that coalition. Alienating, killing, exiling, house arresting, torturing, jailing, anybody that disagreed with it, and with the Supreme Leader since the past 20 years, using the opportunity to contract the political space and shift the system further and further and further to the hard Islamist right. And that basically means that you have less, uh, a smaller pool of elites than ever before in Tehran. But this smaller pool of elites is at least in terms of its enmity and worldview more cohesive, uh, which means it's a harder adversary to crack. Uh, but this is essentially what Khamenei is doing, the Supreme Leader of Iran Khamenei is doing to set the stage for phase two for after his passing. And there is a phrase I actually heard from a, a friend from Iran who was describing this to me. And it's actually a Persian phrase, which they used in the 1980s when they were purging the revolution, when they were purging the universities and all of the public institutions of qualified technocrat professionals. Uh, and the phrase they had was taqwa na tavano, which is uh, righteousness, not, not competence. 
And the people that they're promoting to the helm now, the people that are going to be the next generation, the people that are with the finger on the trigger, the people in the councils like the Supreme National Security Council making the decision, being promoted to the new ultra hardline parliament, uh, the people likely to replace the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei are not people whose resumes of competence come to the fore. They are people who have proven their loyalty over time. And seldom does adherence to a backward, perverse interpretation uh, of 12 Rashidism, that is the state model, religion of the Islamic Republic, ever come or correlate with competence. So that's the, the hard shift to the right. And this hard shift is actually more comfortable with the use of force, with the, the grotesque forms of domestic repression that we've seen. These are two sides of the same coin. Internal repression, external aggression. Shows of strength, shows of strength. And they have some problematic view. I, that's putting it mildly. But they have some problematic perceptions that America is on the way out. That you can intimidate your way through with the Arabs. That good partners are the likes of Russia and China on the world stage. That the Iranian people must be either coward or rendered apathetic and not a part of their own political destiny. These are the views. These are the baseline views that they have. And, and that's what makes it a very tough adversary. So, so let's turn to the US. Um, and I wanna talk about the US policy of appeasement towards Iran that began the moment Obama entered the Oval Office. It was put on hold under Trump and then it began again under Biden. And I think, you know, while Obama's plans to pull the US out of the Middle East and realign the region with Iran as a regional hegemon, that coupled with the JCPOA was awful and dangerous, but Biden's past three plus years in office have been utterly horrific, sending the message to the world that the U.S. is in retreat, it's not a reliable ally, and it treats its enemies with kid gloves while turning its back on its allies. Um, his his Israel policy since 10-7, I would call a bit bipolar. Of late, it's been, you know, led to Israel feeling abandoned. But he did the right thing on Saturday night. And while I believe that it was motivated by his fear of a full-blown war in the region, um, especially in an election year, um, but October 7th and, and April 13th would not have happened if Team Obama-Biden hadn't put daylight into the U.S.-Israel relationship and if the U.S. had been projecting strength. So it's important to note that under Obama and Biden, the U.S. is funding both sides of this war. Also, when I say bipolar, that's another aspect of it, Israel and Iran. Are, 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 you know, um, recipients of U.S. funds, including the most recent $10 billion sanctions waiver that Biden issued um, a month after 10-7. So can you share how you see U.S. policy in the region and whether you believe the U.S. has learned anything from this recent attack? Is that going to lead, is Saturday going to lead to any changes in the way that the U.S. approaches Iran? There were in the early months after 10-7 some very helpful changes and signs, not just rhetorical, but in terms of substance, vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration in Israel. And then to be able to use that into a prism to reset some regional relationships. Um, I think that has atrophied. I think that has long gone. Ironically, in the week before the Iranian strike, I saw some green shoots of that same change. Perhaps you're right to call it bipolar or shifting or whatever else, because it was what it was pre-10-7, then a few months after 10-7, then it began to atrophy, then it atrophied such that it took Iranian threats to get it to come back. And then in the immediate recession of those threats, the cessation of those threats, uh, it's going back to where it was. And I couldn't put it to you in a sh more sharper way than this. Post October, uh, post uh, April 13, 14, Israel is looking for deterrence. Post April 13, 14, the Biden administration is reverting to de escalation and de confliction. And, <coughs> pardon me, and it's being actually, in my view, put on steroids. <coughs> pardon me. Let me just mute this one moment. Sorry, I've been That's, talking so much for the past few days. I know. <laughs> Surprised you still have a voice. <laughs> yeah, let's not jinx it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and horror. Um, 
the de-escalation, de-conflation is put on steroids by virtue of 2024 being an election year and the politics of the Gaza war with shifting demographic and geographic balances and the Democratic Party being what they are, impacting Biden's thinking about the Middle East. The problem is just as much as Iran is a closed society and we're able to detect those shifting domestic balances, America is very much an open society. And I think Iran has been able to detect our shifting trend lines and balances. And that's precisely why uh, the regime may have calculated that the risk it took may have been worth the reward, which is that Iran, the weaker power, gets to be the first to go over against Israel when Israel for 20 years had been looking for, to borrow a phrase from George W. Bush at the UN, a permission slip to go uh, against the Islamic Republic, first its nuclear facilities, then the regime, whatever else. Um, and yet it's Iran that commences this element of the conflict. It's Iran that breaks from its own norm of what they used to call or responding in kind. You know, one would have thought that after an attack on a consulate, there would have been an attack on an actual consulate. Uh, the Israelis even thought that. You saw them scale down operations and embassies and, col and, and, and consulates, and then the threat level was, was risen for uh, Jewish cultural centers around the world because of the trend line of the proven past of how Iran does indeed respond to these things. But this was a regime that feels comfortable escalating. It has a newfound capability, these long-range strike weapons, nothing to still poo-poo about. We can get into the numbers and Iron Dome and Arrow and everything else after. Um, there's that. There is its perception of the U.S. on the retreat and wanting to leave. And there is the gamble that Israel can't afford this amid Gaza, amid a six-front war, amid anything else. And that led an otherwise cautious but dangerous supreme leader to greenlight this operation. And now, ironically, they are entirely banking on Biden bailing them out. Because of, again, just like we assessed what the trend line would be with Iran, they're assessing what the trend line would be with America. So, OK, so it's been reported that Biden was informed of the attack by Turkey. I've also heard reports that Iran also informed the Swiss um, and the message got back to, to the Biden administration and that Blinken's response was that it had to be within certain limits. Um, Yagal Carmen Car has recently reported that Iran pre-coordinated its attack against Israel with the U.S. so that no one will be hurt and war with Israel will be avoided. Many are calling this a choreographed war. Do you know if that's accurate? And um, I mean, it, you know, it, it goes to, and I'm, I'll <clears throat> ask you about this in a, in a couple minutes, but, you know, Biden telling uh, Israel to take the win, you know, how much is, is the U.S., you, you raised this, so how much is the U.S. really controlling what Israel and Iran are doing in this situation? Well, there is a win for sure. You know, if anyone emerges a victor, it's not just Israel in the first uh, hours after April 13, 14. It's the idea of, again, robust air and missile defense. This is something critical, not just for the future of Israel, but for the future of stability in the Middle East, what a more integrated Middle East could look like, coming together to offset certain threats that they believe that they all, they all share. You, you saw the green shoots of that, again, in, in response to these Iranian launches. But I would just politely take a step back. I'm not disconnecting the dots between the Turkey story and the Swiss story and the Iranian allegations and the alleged Blinken comments. Um, but I do think we need to put it into perspective. Those who put forward this as the only thesis need to square the circle of how do you, how do you justify over 100 ballistic missile launches as just a symbolic attack? Some of them with five to 10 times the warhead weight of a drone warhead. Um, and if Iran does indeed, and I, and I, with immense respect to um, General McKinsey, the former CENTCOM commander, um, some of the numbers that he's put out, if Iran does indeed only have 150 medium range ballistic missiles and it fired some 100 to 120 some odd, that would be exceptionally imprudent. That also doesn't correlate with how they act. So unless they really felt the need to respond here, uh, it actually doesn't square the circle with this is just a choreographed dance. I know there is a desire to see it this way. Um, and it is entirely plausible that the Iranians did give the U.S. the heads up. But that doesn't mean they still didn't want to strike. 
that just may have meant that they may have been banking on that U.S. role in playing the role of de-conflictor and restrainer of Israel on the back end of a strike. That's entirely possible. So here's how I see it. Iran wanted to restore its deterrence. Iran also wanted to make sure Israel's biggest partner did not get involved in the war. That explains the diplomatic outreach. Because again, Iran's kind of soft messaging here is, look, they did something, you have to let me get something. And we may actually fall for that. Because the they did something, the Israelis going after the, the Brigadier General Zahidi in the quote unquote consulate. Let's unpack who this individual was. Just hours, maybe I think 48 to 72 hours after that individual was killed, you even had Iranian press outlets saying, yeah, this guy was involved in the planning of October 7th. And, the, and you see regime media now slowly hedging towards actually soft admitting their role in October 7th. You see this with Khamenei-linked media. This is, this is an evolution because they feel comfortable with it now. It's safe to say it now. Um, so Israel finding Zahidi going after that quote-unquote annex, that was a target of opportunity. That was a way to actually hold Iran back, to get Iran to take note of what has been going on around Israel as Israel is trying to finish up the war in Gaza so that the regime doesn't continue to fund and back these multi-directional rocket, missile, drone, and mortar attacks from Yemen, from Lebanon, from Syria, from elsewhere against it. So I don't see that as the instigator for a war. But Iran was trying to sell it as, okay, they did this, I need to do this, and we can call it even. And then the Biden line of take the win is understandable if your philosophy is deconfliction and de-escalation. If your philosophy is this place is not worth it, I have to head out. And in that world, you have just created a very dangerous scenario uh, in which Israel is going to indeed have to respond. And then Iran is banking on no American backstopping of Israel, which can actually lead to more conflict, not less. Because the Islamic Republic has always been trying to flesh out the differences, render these differences into the daylight between Israel and America. And the greater the differences, the more emboldened the regime is, right? If you had America and Israel since October 7 on lockstep, you would have likely had to have the regime rethink this sort of operation. It's because this stuff followed the UN ceasefire language drama. It's because this stuff followed the Rafa drama. It's because this stuff followed the World Food Kitchen, whatever drama. It's because the regime sensed these fissures that it wanted to press upon them. That's the way the Islamic Republic operates. Yes, there's strategy. Yes, there's crazy ideology, but they are opportunists. And they will press their advantage until they feel otherwise. And the most dangerous thing now about the take the win, even though, again, I understand the escalation, deconfliction, you probably poll Americans, they want less, not more to do with the Middle East. That is an understandable sentiment. But what is not understandable is to say, okay, you have just permitted this adversary, which has been fighting in the shadows for 45 years, to launch this gigantic barrage against you. If you don't respond, you risk normalizing this. You are the one who risks bringing more war, not less, to the region. Because that's there is a straight line from the U.S. not responding to the downing of its throne in 2019, to the uh, attacks against the Saudi oil facilities in 2019, to the attacks against the U.S. bases in 2020, uh, to the attack uh, on uh, Kurdish targets in Iraq in 2022, killing an American for the first time ever with an Iranian ballistic missile, and we did nothing. So of course the regime is going to calculate, even if you do kill them, they might not do anything. Yeah, uh, um, it, the, the administration's foreign policy, and in particular with regard to the Middle East, is um, is really frightening. Um, and, I, you know, the you point out that when the U.S., when there is daylight, which is Obama's term, daylight between the U.S. and Israel, um, bad actors see that and they and they take advantage of it. I mean, you know what? I'm sure you're asked this all the time. How can letting Tehran terrorize Israel's nine million residents residents who had to spend the night in bomb shelters? But you even talked about, you know, in the lead up to that, um, the fear in the days before that, um, with 300 of these missiles and drones lobbed at it. How can how can Israel just take the win and, and not respond? I mean, does the U.S. I would. Um, do I, I just, you, go ahead. 
you, you just inspired something in me. A reminder, I, I don't have Twitter, but a bunch of people sent me this thing from Twitter. Um, the win, right? Did you guys see the uh, Ronan Bergman comment about the Israeli national security deliberations about when the launch was happening? Uh, it was a comment by Ronan Bergman, uh, uh, basically on some unnamed source who had been participating in these Israeli, I don't know if it was cabinet or what, what government level, national security deliberations about the potential impact of these strikes, about what had been launched by Iran, right? This is before all the successful interceptions, but it's while we know the launch is coming. It can be hours for the drones. It could be minutes for the ballistic missiles. The Ron I'm paraphrasing his line, but you guys can find it on Twitter. I think it was in the New York Times as well. Ronan Bergman had said that this source had said that had those conversations been broadcast live, there would have been four million, four million Israelis at Ben Gurion, like trying to get out. Yeah, this is the this is not a win. <laughs> this this is certainly not a win. Like it looks amazing, it looks great that technological superiority, conventional military superiority. Good military to military coordination, good intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, good diplomatic planning, and of course the Iranians tipping off help to impede a disaster. That is that is of course good. But let me let you in on a little secret here about offense defense on this Middle East missile balance. What they fire at you is comparatively cheaper at what you have to fire to offset them. There is various estimates right now about what Israel expended, be it half a billion dollars, a billion dollars to a billion and a half dollars. Then there's, of course, the unnamed expenditures of the U.S. involved here. Then there's the unnamed expenditures of all the other allies and partners involved here. There is a mismatch between some of their capabilities and our capabilities. And beyond that, they say it. In the 2021 war, the 11-day war in May, you had IRGC outlets in Iran mocking Iron Dome, despite the success, because this is a long term. These guys have a death by a thousand cut strategy. They're trying to create social pressure, economic pressure, political pressure, any other kind of pressure is welcomed by them. And what they are doing here is they, they said, whether you intercept or not, you lose. So if you intercept, you, you risk the cost of the expenditure of the more expensive interceptor. This is $40,000. This is $2 million, right? You, you have that mismatch. The, the U.S. government calls this being behind the cost curve, right? The, the cost curve is not in your favor. This is not a win. This is a success for deterrence by denial because you have this architecture of interceptions and planes and jets and missile defense and air defense, and they all work together. That's amazing. But this is costly to maintain. And until you have deterrence by punishment where the adversary knows that that which they fire, you know, those, I don't know, $40,000 drones, half a million to a million dollar missiles, until they know they will risk losing more than that, they will not stop that. And when we talk about normalizing these attacks, there's videos of me at FTD events, 2017, 2018, 2019, ringing the alarm bell about Iran's missile use against ISIS, against the Kurds, against America, allegedly even against uh, Israeli targets. You know. People weren't super, you know, people were concerned, but, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, a number one national security priority, but that was a connect the dots moment because the regime's ballistic missile activities, public launches were being normalized. And now by standing down, you're going to normalize these attacks on a level that you've never seen before against Israel. That is the dilemma. So I just want to, just to clarify, do you believe that the Islamic Republic looks at this as a win? I mean, out, you know, you you heard on by Sunday morning, everybody was saying that it was a pathetic and embarrassing show. But, you know, I would say that tactically, while it may have been a fail because, well, they didn't kill any Jews, strategically, it could be called a, a success, which is sounds like what, you, what you're saying. So is that how you think the Isra Islamic Republic is looking at it? Two things here. One is, I think, politically, it's a win. It's a win because they are trying to say your patron will not support you. They are trying to say your partner will restrain you. They are trying to say you cannot afford to keep intercepting this stuff. Uh, I mean, militarily, no, it's, it's a big loss for the Iranians. And I think strategically in the long run, the Iranians have painted a target on their backs. Ironically, the only people who may be erasing the target might be the Biden administration. But be that as it may, that's that's how I see it. I think the Iranians 
Again, they're not militarily 10 feet tall. The attacks showed that. What they do know how to do very well, and unfortunately, October 7 showed that, and the immediate aftermath of October 7 showed that, because unfortunately, the regime accomplished its goals by October 8, yeah. is yeah. that they can use military means, they can use instrumental violence to affect the political outcome. Whereas America and Israel are very much the reverse. We have immensely superior military means, but we have had a hard time. America in Afghanistan and Iraq, Israel in Gaza and Lebanon, or occasionally in Syria, being able to translate that military power into political success that lasts. And that is the mismatch in these wars. That is the really fundamentally hard trade-off to have to swallow. And then to the second thing is perspective matters. Yes, there's tons of regime propaganda and they're trying to spin this as a win, even though they are going to have to do some serious accounting if what has been reported about these missiles and drones ends up being really true. But you may remember, I think it was Sunday, uh, the Israeli ambassador went to the UN Security Council and he, he held up the iPad. I know, and we know as civilized human beings, that projectiles over holy religious sites is not a good look. But the Islamic Republic, their semi-official press actually spun that as a win. They actually said that this is a lasting photo of the Israelis in the UNSC with an iPad showing the video of the missiles raining down over Al-Aqsa. This is a win. For them, this is what resistance looks like. Th this is the, this is why I said it was a political success. They were trying to telegraph to the world, to the Iranian people, to the Arab people, to the Palestinians, that we are in this fight. You know, this is a, this is a very lay understanding. I know this has zero empirical evidence, but I was talking to this guy at, at this, uh, Puka shop recently in the aftermath of this strike. And, you know, he is, I won't say for where he's from, but he's from the Middle East. He's not Iranian, but he's from the Middle East. He's not Israeli, he's not Iranian, he's from the Middle East. And he just kind of mentioned off the cuff, yeah, Iran doesn't joke around. This is precisely the perception. Like, this is a social perception the regime actually is good at being able to affect. He, the guy didn't say 99% of the stuff was yeah. affected. He, he said, yeah, Iran doesn't joke around. And that image is being used, even though we think like, look, look at this, this is barbarism. They're saying, no, no, this is resistance. Yeah. This is resistance. I mean, if people, if, the, if these guys cared about religious sites, if these guys cared about the fate of Muslims, like maybe instead, even, I even heard that this was true. I have no way to verify it, but in all those track twos and, and Iranian professors and uh, uh, folks from the Arab world and European diplomats and professors and whatever, that the Palestinians used to chastise the Iranians, actually. And the Palestinians used to say to the Iranians, this is, again, reported, there's video of it, of the Iranian professor saying that the Palestinians told me this. The Palestinians would say, we wish rather than you trying to destroy the Jewish state, you would actually help build the Palestinian state. But these guys are not in the construction business. They're in the destruction business. If we cared, if the, any of their proxies cared about, you know, Muslim holy sites, how come the Houthis used to fire ballistic missiles over Mecca? No one gave a damn. Yeah, yeah, important points. Um, so I want to um, turn to Israel, and um, you know, what what do you think that Israel's next steps are going to be? Do you think it's going to retaliate nonetheless, despite Biden warnings not to? Um, and can you discuss how vulnerable you believe that Iran is, given that it basically has lots of offensive weapons, um, but no air force, no weapon defense systems, um, perhaps maybe touch on, I mean, we've, we've talked, you've talked a little bit about ballistic missiles, um, and the extent of, of their arsenal, but also, you know, I'm thinking like, what are Israel's possible targets? And, uh, I'm thinking, you know, are they going to strike Iran maybe in, in the Red Sea, that spy ship? Or do they want to go inside Iran and make it proportional? Proportional would be huge. Um, but I'm also guessing that Biden's told Israel not to attack Iran's oil refineries. It's, of course, an election year and gas prices would skyrocket. So, you know, where are your thoughts on an Israeli um, retaliation? And also, I don't know how much you know about cyber warfare, but if that's part of it. I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts and views and you know if past is prologue the israelis have a lot of options here 
again, I just want to remind everyone, this is a, a going to be a game-changing moment in the Middle East, how Israel responds, when, where, the scale, if it's a campaign, if it's a one-off, if it's only overt, if it's only covert, if it's overt and covert together. Um, first and foremost, there's that doctrine change that we talked about. The Iranians saying, we will respond to you wherever you come from Iran. The Israelis may graduate over time. I don't know if they'll do this, but they may be, you mentioned the spy ship. I wasn't even thinking of that. I don't even know why that spy ship is still there, by the way. I mean, in terms of the, the U.S. and the coalition forces that are also yeah. in similar areas between the Gulf of Aden, the Babo Mendeb, and the Red Sea, how is this ship permitted <laughs> to, to do what it does, given that we even know there was a predecessor spy ship that enabled Houthi targeting? So, you know, this is a this is a target of opportunity for a different series of folks that I don't think Israel needs to concern itself with right now. But again, it gets to that risk aversion and the de-escalation and de-confliction uh, that is is very much like a dogma right now. Um, so Israel might consider a, an external target first. I don't know if it'll do a redo of something in Syria or potentially even a, a, a capability or a militia or something in Iraq to test if the Iranians will come from their territory again. And then if they do come from their territory again, then that becomes the predicate to a much larger response and potentially one that may even have the U.S. on their side. Who knows? Um, there are some reports, I think it was CNN late yesterday, early today, that was saying the Israelis were, were talking about something. NBC was saying it was imminent, uh, but that CNN had alleged there would be some kind of narrower or more tailored military strike. If this is the case, this to me sounds more like a signaling strike to do something so precise, like the exact opposite, right? You said, you mentioned proportional would be like raining down rockets. The last thing the Israelis want to do is target Iranian civilians here. So we should be very careful. On the one hand, tons of Iranians, I don't know if you've seen it on social media, have been doing graffiti, sending messages. There's a whole series of hashtags now uh, saying, yeah, like hit, 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 hit him, like hit Khamenei, go for the Supreme Leader, go for the Supreme Leader's office. Uh, there's even some Iranian dissidents that said, you know, target the mausoleum of the founding father of the Islamic Republic, Khomeini, because it's actually not in the residential area. And it's just a highly symbolic target. And actually, it might trigger protests against the regime. And you have a foreign pressure, domestic pressure kind of a pincer. Um, these are all the things that are, that are being said. But if that CNN report does end up being true, the contrast between an Iran and Israel militarily could be like Iran, Islamic Republic firing all these things, uncapable and rendering uh, these weapons as tools of terror against the population. And then conversely, Israel hyper-precise taking out one you know, missile base or uh, one command and control headquarter with you know, very precise Jericho missiles, no civilian casualties. This is something the Israelis are going to have to be very, very, very precise about. I mean, this, this, this can be no no playful what, whatever is going on here. Uh, the Iranian people are the most pro-Israeli people in the Middle East. You know, out of all the populations that, you know, put up a Palestinian flag on October 8th, I think on October 9th, the Iranians in a soccer stadium uh, told uh, told people to, to shove the flag up, you know, where. This is literally in a video. 10,000 Iranians in a stadium chanting this. Uh, this is a ground shift of a sociological contrast of the salience of the Palestinian issue for the Arab world versus the the non-salience of the Palestinian issue for the Iranians, such that since 2009, they've been chanting, not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life for Iran, in nearly every round of protests. I mean, this tells you that there is actual strategic and ideational affinity between Iranians and Israelis, while the regime has strategic and ideational enmity. And so I would only caution Israel, in however they wish to go ahead and reestablish deterrence, do not squander that asset. That is your biggest long-term asset. If you think something can be rebuilt with the Abraham Accords, imagine what the Cyrus Accords could do. Just imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, before I get to the audience questions, I just want to ask you one, one final question of mine. And I wanted you to discuss the regional conception of the various Gulf and Arab nations. Um, do you view Israel as the strong horse? I think we we view Israel as the strong horse. But do you um, believe that that perception will continue if Israel is prevented from responding um, and also finishing what it started in Gaza? Because we just learned that Netanyahu announced that they will not be going into Rafah. Um, so, you know, it was very heartening to learn that Saudi Arabia joined Jordan, um, the U.S., U.K., and France in destroying Iranian missiles and drones on Saturday. 
Um, and I understand that Saudi normalization is very close. Hopefully they've realized that the, they have bigger fish to fry with Iran now. Um, a Palestinian state is not really helpful to their own national security. Um, and in fact, actually, there was a Saudi official who recently acknowledged that um, Hamas's 10-7 massacre was intended to derail normalization and called Iran's behavior irresponsible. And that was a Saudi official. So um, I, I think it was Elliot Abram Abrams who said that the future of the Middle East depends on American leadership, both inside and outside of America. If inside our political leaders understand that peace can only be achieved through strength, the Middle East will be dominated by the U.S. and its allies. But if not, we'll have a regional a region dominated by Iran and its proxies, Russia, China. So, um, you know, those are three very dangerous nuclear powers. So where do, you, where do you see the conception of the Arab nations in the region? Uh, you know, just on the, on the Elliot quote, I had the pleasure of seeing him last week and he is remarkably erudite and perceptive and literally said, I think, almost the same thing verbatim uh, about leadership, internal and external. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is really a ref. This is not a referendum about, you know, this missile versus this sanction. Uh, those are important, but that's this is really about who are we, what do we believe, what in life is worth getting out of bed for, what if we must has to be done to prevent killing, fighting, and dying, and what in life is worth defending to the level of killing, fighting, and dying. These are, these are existential philosophical questions that from how you answer them will flow those debates over the right policy. And central to the adjudication of them is exactly what Elliot said, which is American leadership. It can be quite easy to say that this region is a junk bond. In fact, you've had three very different presidents. Uh, and as you know, supportive of President Trump's Iran policy as I am, there were lots of missteps in there as well that got us to where we are. And three very different men, Obama, Trump, Biden, with three very different philosophies, essentially saying the same thing about the region. The region is a junk bond. And that is very unhelpful to the people who live in between uh, the Arabs and the, uh, the, the Israelis and the Iranians, which is the Arabs, particularly on the southern tier, the Arabs of the Persian Gulf. Financially, politically, these are some of the most well-connected places in the world. On the northern tier, financially, politically, these are some of the more devastated places in the world by war and by the Iranian proxy network, which is why the northern tier, with the absence of Jordan, you have a constellation of entities that support the Islamic Republic because their message, their regime's message, can only be ascendant as a revisionist revolutionary message if you are a downtrodden and dispossessed person with no prospects with, versus a sharp contrast with the Gulf which is in exact opposition to that Iranian message because of the emancipation, because of the opportunity, because of this cognizance that this stuff is not worth fighting, killing, and dying for. And again, that flows from that kind of leadership. Some of the missteps made by those three different presidents affecting uh, Gulf leadership has essentially fostered what you call in international politics hedging, right? They understand that America is the best place to partner up with, particularly for economics and politics. But they also see a rising China. And in fact, for Saudi Arabia, for example, very interestingly, uh, sells oil to China. Its major economic partner uh, is China. And if energy for security was the historic paradigm for the US-Saudi relationship, and if the energy element has changed, and if the Saudi sense that because of our uh, left, right, center, in and out uh, policy towards Assad in Syria, if our uh, you know, sanctions relief and JCPOA driven approach towards Iran, if are not having their back on the Yemen war, uh, and all of these other things uh, leads to their security being undermined. Well, if the energy element of the relationship is already this way, the security one may fall elsewhere. More recently, another example, uh, in the UAE, the UAE a couple months ago hosted uh, President Vladimir Putin, who has a arrest order against him. And for American policymakers looking to stop this hedging, there should be no sharper contrast uh, in their mind than American jets doing this big parade for when Putin was there. It was a huge hullabaloo. Painting the Russian flag in the sky with their exhaust plumes. What, what an image. And mm -hmm. I know some in, some in the States would say that Benham, their flag is red, white, and blue. Our flag is red, white, and blue. You're making too much out of it. 
But uh, to which I would say, well, the French flag and the British flag is also red, white, and blue. But in the same manner, it was done to welcome the Russian president, um, which is a huge sign. You know, the UAE has been, you know, great on Arab-Israeli normal on Arab-Israeli normalization at the Abraham Accords, uh, but also it's been a mixed player on the Iran sanctions issue. And these are all examples of hedging because of a lack of a clear direction. And this continued lack of a clear direction, or conversely, a clear direction that we are disinterested in the region is going to end up doing things that foster more instability, not just for Israel, but for America in the long run, because it'll have more enmeshment by America's adversaries, Russia and China, which will leave Israel open to more predation by Russia and China. It's the exact things that we don't want for a partner that, as you just saw, April 13, April 14, we have such high level, high tech, mill to mill relationships with and can interoperate so easily and so well. Um, so th these are some worrying concerns I have about, you know, the Arabs are hedging, but they're hedging because they see the trend line. Sometimes Washington lives in the moment or lives in the electoral cycle, you could say, or lives between tweets. Uh, the conception of history in the region is much longer. And when you said strong horse, I'm reminded of that Lee Smith book. I don't think the Arabs will undo normalization, those that have done it, if there is a certain change in Israel's politics or Israel's policy. Um, but I do think in terms of that hedging, because they will see Israel as still part of that pro-Western, pro-American order, and if they're having to hedge more publicly this way, uh, the price of the normalization will go up. Just like, unfortunately, the price of the normalization has gone up since October 8th. So I want to get to some of the audience questions, Ben. And that was a that was a great response, very in insightful. Ben, thank you for that. Um, someone asked, Israel's always said they will defend themselves by themselves. So was this a change from that doctrine? And what does it pretend for Israel going forward? Um, will they be limited in response options because of it? Well, we're seeing that, but... There's no doubt that Israel will continue to defend themselves, and that's why even amid and by defend themselves by themselves, um, not just Allah Zionism, but also just Allah, the regional architecture of that state in that part of the world, fighting the war as it did in different styles since 1948. Um, that's just endemic in the structure of how that state has been organized and how it's been fighting different sets of wars against state actors, against non-state actors. This stuff is existential and get very dicey very quickly. Um, even one take I heard between April 13, 14 was just a reminder of the strategic depth of Iran and the size of Iran and literally the lack thereof for the Israelis, which will necessarily have to produce a different kind of military response because of factors that you don't control, like geography. From that, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? Um, I mean, I it was basically, what does this pretend for Israel um, that they are no longer really defending themselves by themselves? Is, is it sort of a, you know? Uh, yeah, so, that, so that's okay. So that's historic Israel. This, I think, was a case that can be replicated over time, but will be costly. And because it will be costly, you should want to help Israel defend itself with something potentially offensive, because otherwise this deterrence by denial architecture is going to cost you a lot more over time than you think. So there is this element as well. I don't think all these states rushing to de help defend Israel undermined that philosophy. In fact, I think they saw that one should see that as this is something worth defending. You know, it's not like they rushed in for an ally who had not made any budgetary uh, investments in air and missile defense. They rushed in to find an ally with the most robust coverage. And then the U.S., France, U.K., whatever, function as the extended arm of that coverage. Yes, Israel benefited immensely from the fact that America patrolled the airspace between uh, Iraq and Jordan and essentially was able to, I think they said they shot down 80 drones of the hundred some odd, the Americans shot down. This is the point of having a good partner, but that is done for someone who has something worth defending. You know, this right. is not a freebie. This is not a, what is the Henry Kissinger line? Foreign policy is not missionary work. This is not missionary work. 
This is the Islamic Republic of Iran, home to these arsenals, that you want to stop these things from flying. That in and of itself is worth defending anyway. But when you add that on to a partner who has this robust capability, who has made the necessary budgetary investment in their defense, looking at you, NATO, uh, these are things that are actually worth doing. And they don't undermine the, the fundamental philosophy of that kind of Sabra, Zionist, do it yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstrap, pioneer style that the Israelis have had in that past historical moment, yeah. in my view. So following on what you just said, one of our board members asked the question that if Israel responds militarily, what do you think the, the coalition that the US, UK, France, Jordan, um, will they continue to coalesce? Honestly? If they do, it won't be as robust. This is my, because of the politics of the situation, which in my view, because there may, there essentially will have to be some kind of Israeli military response because of the deterrence equation we talked about, but that response doesn't have to be rushed. And it would be a mistake for Israel to rush it and all these press reports about a uh, imminent whatever would rush it. I know the Israelis may talk of a closing window or whatever, the Iranians know the Israelis have the overwhelming capability and the regime should be living in fear as to when and how that response could look like. Don't let the Islamic Republic be the one who benefited from 12 days of fear and panic, right? Now the Israelis can exact the revenge first with this psychological element of the conflict. Layered on top of that is it's a real win with the way Jordan was, you saw the rhetoric and the foreign policy and the commentary um, from what was a historic partner of Israel after 1994. Um, and some would say politely, that was very unhelpful uh, in the past six months. But you saw the sudden change. Yeah. It, would, it would be a shame for Jordan to emulate the bipolarity of its partner, the United States in this regard. And in this sense, if there's something Israel can do to bring Jordan along, uh, that will be key. And if it can't even bring Jordan along, well, then to placate or to tamp down or to help manage. You know, diplomacy is about management. It's not a solution. People say, oh, the diplomatic solution. It's not a solution. It's a method of management. You have to manage these things better. And in the aftermath of this successful defense, Israel can and should lay the diplomatic groundwork to rally around a better pressure policy towards Iran, towards a more integrated, peaceful, and prosperous region, and towards a least common denominator approach to what the good life looks like, to be able to answer those good questions. Is your government oriented towards missiles and rockets at the only democracy in the region, or is your government interested in doing something else for your own people? Um, thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, Ben, um, before we go. And I'm sorry for everybody, I didn't get to all of these questions, but you were talking about hedging bets earlier in the context of the Gulf nations. But what about Israel? Is Israel hedging its bets with um, India, China, Russia, you know, Saudi well, Arabia? With India, well, with India, there is both a strategic and ideational element to the relationship. Uh, with China, I think it was just commercial and mercantilist. And I think the Israelis went so far into the commercial and mercantilist world, they didn't see the predation that exists behind this stuff with China in Southeast Asia, with China in Sub-Saharan Africa, that the Americans from 50,000 feet and much farther away have been able to see and have rightly been calling out. Uh, with Russia, it, it's a little bit different. You know, for me, even when I come into Israel, it's always interesting with the the, the immigration lines, how many are in Cyrillic versus how many are in Hebrew versus how many are in English. It's a fundamentally different geographic and demographic makeup. Um, and in some ways, like if I remember, I think it was during the Bennett government, they were talking about managing or trying to play the role of mediator. Uh, Russia is beyond that today. And my fear is that the more the strategic competition heats up, the more the Russians will exact that cost on the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis favoring the Iranians in Syria. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but it may happen. And I am worried about that. And because that is something the Russians can dangle over the heads of the Israelis, I wonder what it is that they are currently getting from the Israelis. Um, I understand the realities of the region. Those are the same realities that are plaguing our partners uh, in the Persian Gulf, for example. Um, but it's unhelpful, too, to see America's allies have to hedge in this way. Because the more the hedging, the more that can encourage the the 
opposite pole of the behavior to say, well, if they're hedging, then to hell with them, we're going. And that creates a counterproductive tension that pulls on, uh, on this rope, on this thread that can eventually break it. And with this thread line, I'm thinking of this Khrushchev line that he sent Kennedy uh, at, the, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was, do not pull on the rope on which you have tied the knot of war. Uh, not that there's a knot of war, thank God, between Israel and America, but it's it's a helpful rope not to pull on. Yeah. Um, ben, um, thank you so much. It's it's after one, and I want to let you go back to doing all of your important work. And we just so appreciate you sharing your insights with us. I urge everybody to follow Ben Um's work. Um, you're not on Twitter, but you are very prolific, and you're published everywhere, and you're on all sorts of news channels. So please, everybody, follow his important work. And again, thank, thank you. you very much. I wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Lori. Appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in today. Bye bye. Bye-bye.